I I think there's a case that he's closer to mediocre than second worst president. Okay, of all and, time, I, and that's say. fine with me. But I can demolish your arguments, and it won't take me a long time because I gotta <laughs> go. Before Tucker Carlson, there was Bill O'Reilly. For many years, he was the most popular news anchor in America, being showcased in Fox News' primetime lineup. In 2017, Bill O'Reilly left Fox News amid allegations of sexual harassment and a New York Times piece about settlements around those allegations. He took the O'Reilly factor independent. Since then, he has managed to maintain a massive audience, and he continues to throw his weight around in the media ecosystem. In September, he was interviewed by Tucker Carlson on X in a conversation that drew over 20 million views. Recently, I found out that Mr. Bill O'Reilly was reading Tangle. He was tuned in to some of the work we were doing. I found this out because he invited me on his show to chat about the 2024 election and then invited me back again after our first interview. I was pleased by this invitation. I'm happy to know always that Tangle is reaching people from across the political spectrum. But after a couple of our conversations, I got interested in turning the tables. I wanted to hear from Bill about his experience at Fox News, about the 2024 election, about his relationship with people like John Stewart and Tucker Carlson. I wanted to know how he viewed the current media ecosystem, how he viewed our current president, how he viewed our former president. I had a lot of questions for him. Before our interview, we were scheduled to sit down for about 45 minutes, but his team emailed and said that he could only fit in 20 to his very busy schedule, which I certainly understand. Ultimately, though, when we sat down and started chatting, the interview lasted for about 35, which I was happy about. We talked about some of the really big issues facing voters and the country right now. We talked about some of the stuff happening in media, what he thought of Jon Stewart's return, what he thought of Tucker Carlson being in Russia. It was an interesting interview. I'm very glad he sat down. I hope we get to do it again sometime in the future, and I hope you guys enjoy it. Bill O'Reilly, thanks for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Sure. Anything I can do to help tangle. <laughs> You're a new a new fan. You I, you've given us a couple of shout outs. We've got some of your readers on our on our newsletter platform now, which is interesting. I I'd love to maybe start with a little bit of 2024, where things are at, what you're seeing. Uh, you were obviously still a conservative heavyweight throwing his opinions around in this space. This race looks like it's Trump's, obviously. How do you, how do you feel about the presumptive 2024 nominee right now? Well, I wouldn't say I'm a conservative because I'm not an ideologue. I try to be a problem solver. I believe that traditional tenets have really served the country well since 1776, with some exceptions, but uh, I, I don't buy into the progressive far left view. Uh, liberalism is OK unless you basically are ignoring reality. And the same thing can be said for the conservative crew. I mean, if you're just going to deny that uh, there are solutions to be, sound, be found on the left, then it doesn't go anywhere. But my job, essentially, Isaac, is to present uh, what is actually happening to uh, my listeners and viewers. And we are the most successful uh, independent news agency in the world now. Um, and then give an opinion about how it affects them. Now, it's a very narrow cast, what we do. So here we are in uh, early February 2024 with the uh, presidential election coming up fast. We've got a big intrusion on the Supreme Court um, and a big um, movement to eliminate Donald Trump from the ballot in November. And that is being led by the Justice Department of the United States. There's no question that this prosecution by the special counsel is designed to take Trump off the board. It's not designed to um, impose justice or inhibit behavior in the future. It is solely a political act. And the reason I say that is because you could do this to any president. George W. Bush, for example, after he left office, you could say that he incited torture. 
And it was because of him that Guantanamo Bay and uh, Abu Ghraib in Iraq and all of that, and all of these uh, suspected terrorists were roughed up and waterboarded. You got to prosecute that man. Hey, you can't do that. And Trump is basically saying, look, I, as president, believed, and he did. He absolutely did. I know Trump as well as anybody in the world knows him, that the election was fraudulent. So I took steps to counter what I believed, and I'm, it's my right to do that as president. So the D.C. Circuit Federal Court said no. They threw it out this week. But if you look at it in a fair way, Trump has a very strong point. If it gets to the Supreme Court, I think Trump may win. They'll reverse the, uh, the lower federal court in D.C. One more point. Trump cannot get a fair trial in a district. So the special counsel Smith knows that. You got to move that trial to central Virginia or somewhere where he's got at least a shot of getting a jury that doesn't hate his guts. Five percent of the electorate in D.C. voted for Trump. Ninety five percent did not. You tell me he gets a fair trial there. He does not. OK, all is all is very disturbing to me. I'm I'm glad you went there because I, I wanted to talk a little bit about this and, and kind of the state of some of his legal troubles. So I agree with you on some things and disagree on others. I think the things I agree on are I agree that he can't get a fair trial in D.C. Um, and I agree that there are some political motivations behind parts of this prosecution. Obviously, Jack Smith is trying to speed it up to get it out before the election, which, you know, some people believe there's justification for. Plenty of people can frame that as being politically motivated. I think I disagree about whether Trump should be liable here. I mean, just to give you a quick analogy, if I believe somebody stole my computer and I break into their apartment to steal it back, but they didn't actually steal my computer, I still just committed a crime by breaking into their apartment and stealing something that didn't belong to me. So Trump's belief that the election was stolen is not necessarily an excuse for him to commit a crime and doesn't absolve him of any criminal acts if the election wasn't stolen. So I'm curious how you think about it in that context. I mean, do you believe that there were things going on in the 2020 election that he had a right to take some of the actions that he took? Because Well, I- I'm, I'm not looking at it. I'm looking at it from a purely legal point of view. Okay, there is no evidence that that election was fraudulent on a mass level. But we know that if there were evidence to that, it would be in the court system. It is not. But remember something. You have to prove in a criminal court, which is what this is, which is myth, beyond a reasonable doubt that the person committed a crime. So what crime is Trump charged with? He's not charged with insurrection, although the media says that every day that he is, he isn't. He's charged with a conspiracy. A conspiracy to do what? According to Smith, the conspiracy is to undermine an election and nullify the votes of the American people. Trump can go in and will go into court and say, this advisor, this constitutional attorney, this person all told me that I had the power to raise these questions and to raise scenarios of alternate electors under the Constitution. And those people will testify to that. So if you go back to Bush, and remember, Isaac, I'm a historian, the most popular historian in the world. You are talking to him right now. (laughs) Okay? In the world. George W. Bush's defense on torture, which absolutely happened. And he ordered it, was that his advisors told him that it didn't fall under the torture statutes. That was it. Okay? Nothing was brought against him because it was in his job purview. Same exact thing here. Trump's going to walk in. He's going to say this one, that one, this one, that one told me that all of this was legal, and because I believed it to be true, this is what I did. There's no way on earth you can convict him. 
Because if you do convict them, you can convict every subsequent president, like Biden with open border. You can convict Biden of dereliction of duty, of failure to uphold his oath to obey the laws in the United States because he has clearly not obeyed them. But Biden's going to go in and tell you, oh, no, no, no. My guys told me I could ignore the asylum situation that was passed by Congress. I didn't have to follow it. You see what I'm talking about here? Let, let me ask you maybe a quick counter hypothetical, I guess. Would you prefer that President Biden, that George W. Bush, and that Donald Trump could all be held accountable for actions they took? Absolutely not. So because you would you would rather unbelievable, unbelievable chaos if you as a president have a threat of after you leave office being criminally prosecuted for decisions you make. We don't have a country anymore. So at, at what what's the threshold or what's the line that a president could cross and then be criminally prosecuted, I guess, for for actions he took while in office, in your opinion? Bribery. All right. If you if you're in office and you're taking money um, from somebody and that comes out, then there's no excuse that that was part of your job or that you were advised that you could take money. You took the money, you put it in a bank account in the Caymans. They found it. You'd be prosecuted. That's a crime. If you look at the Smith charges, it's all about conspiracy. Which you can charge you, and I can charge you with a conspiracy today, Isaac. <laughs> conspiracy to mislead people by founding tangle. Now that would be bogus, but I could do it. You could feds could march in and put you in cuffs right now. So I, and I, do I do think one of the interesting points of your defense here for Trump that I, I actually find quite compelling is that he believes the election was stolen and he has actual professionals and legal advisors around him who are telling the telling him the election was stolen. Right. You mentioned at the top that, you know, you have a relationship with the former president. Did you ever give him a, a whisper in his ear that, hey, maybe these people around you are giving you bogus advice? Was he responsive to that kind of incursion on, on what people were telling him around him? Well, I can't give you answers about private conversations that I have with Donald Trump because that wouldn't be right. Everything that uh, the president and I talk about Unless he says, yeah, go ahead. I won't, I won't um, divulge. But I will tell you this. On my commentary, which we do on a daily basis, on BillOReilly.com, on The First, on uh, DirecTV, you name it, I'm way overexposed. He got the message that I did not buy into this. And he got it fast. Because I told my audience very quickly there was no substance to the election fraud allegations unless they were filed in federal court with affidavits. And that I, as an honest journalist, was not going to listen to Sidney Powell or Rudy Giuliani or any of these people until they filed. And none of them did. Trump knew that from day one. I'm I'm curious how you feel like your former network handled some of this. I mean, Fox News obviously still one of the most influential places uh, in, in the media industry. They got a lot of heat for bringing on and airing some folks who are spreading things about Dominion voting system stuff like that. You obviously left the network in 2017. What was it like for you to watch their their coverage of some of the allegations of fraud and post election stuff? Okay, so if I had been at Fox News in 2020, none of this would have ever happened. None of it. Because I would have used my platform at 8 o'clock, the O'Reilly Factor, to do exactly what I did on the No Spin News, to look into the camera and say, this is bogus unless you file it. And I would have had Brit Hume with me, and I would have had a, a bunch of other of our very credible contributors and we would have laid it out, and I would have put an end to it. There wouldn't be anybody at Fox that would have gone up against us. No one. That's number one. So the fact that I wasn't in the chair cost Fox a billion dollars. That's how much money it cost them. With the judgment that uh, Dominion had, all the lawyers' fees, they got another lawsuit coming up against them, they'll lose. 
a billion. Okay? Now, why did it happen? It happened because after Roger Ailes left, and then um, about nine months later, Bill O'Reilly left, there was no central authority in the network. You get it was at fiefdoms. Everybody ran their own shows the way they wanted to. There was no real management level. And so you had people at Fox who were telling the audience, yeah, it's fraud. And I'm going to put it on somebody and they're going to say it. And, uh, and they just sat there mute. You can't do that. You can't do it. Um, but they did it. And they paid a terrible price for doing it. So that's pretty much all I can say is that whenever you have a news organization, I've been in this business next year, it'll be 50 years. You've got to have standards that come down from management about what you can do and what you can't do. That's gone. You know, there's no standards at MSNBC. Those people, I mean, they didn't say any most insane stuff every day. Nobody holds them to account. Oh, it's a racist country. No, it's not. And you can't just say, oh, uh, well, we'll bring on a counterpoint of view, which they rarely do, by the way. Um, just the fact that you're saying the United States of America is a racist country is an irresponsible statement. Okay, you can pick out one or two incidents if you want, but that's not what they do. So press standards, which is why I actually follow you, Isaac. Uh, there are a few places that now I look at. <clears throat> SEM4 is one. Tangle. Um, daily chatter for overseas news, where I think I can get a fairly honest take. But I don't read the New York Times or Washington Post. They're not newspapers anymore. They're left-wing journals. I don't read the Epic Times. I don't, I don't do that. I mean, I'm, I'm not in the business of sorting through indoctrination. So your question about what happened was horrible for the journalistic industry. It, it was horrible. But here's the bottom line of it. People believe what they want to believe. We're living in a country where facts really don't matter all that much to maybe the majority of our citizenry. They believe what they want. And whatever they believe, they want to hear it. And that's what the television news agencies and the newspapers are doing. They're giving the choir the song. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly that's a core element of why we've built what we've built is because we recognize people are are going around and essentially just feeding themselves things that confirm their priors. Yeah. I, I'm I'm curious. I mean, uh, you know, you were a headline act at Fox News, like you said, the heavyweight. And after you left, Tucker Carlson took over your spot and became sort of the face of the network effectively. And now he's gone independent as well and left Fox News. Where do you think this is going? Do you view network news stations as being the influential places they used to be? Or do you think folks who are independent like you are are actually driving the narrative in a lot of political circles across the country right now? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it's hard for me to calibrate that. And, um, but I can tell you this. The audience for all news is diminishing incredibly quickly in this country, which is very dangerous. Los Angeles Times pretty much got a business. Okay, and they're not coming back because they turned into a left-wing journal and any moderate or conservative in, in the Southern California area go, I'm going to read this. This is insane. They're gone. Television, Fox News primetime reaches 2 million people. Maybe 200,000 between the ages of 25 to 54. That's nothing. I used to do eight. I used to do a million 25 to 54. What they do now is, is a shadow of what they used to do. And the others are lower. The others are lower. So their influence has declined dramatically. The network news, the three nightly newscasts, you total them all up, maybe 15 million viewers, maybe 4 million 25 to 54s. It's the older people. Average age of CNN, 70, about 70, 68, 71 for Fox in that range. 
because these are the people who don't do technology. They just sit there and they do what they always did. They got the martini, they got the clicker. They don't really care what's on. Okay, and I'm not diminishing those people, like, you know. But the vibrance of presenting information to the American people is on social media. That's where it is. My audience, the bulk of my audience is in YouTube. I mean, it, it, and it's incredible because I don't even do any of that. I mean, I'm, a, I'm the biggest Luddite in the world, okay? So my son is at Oxford in England. He plays lacrosse for them. And he's uh, playing uh, a Wales team, Swansea. And Oxford waxes him, right? So after the game, the tradition is you line up and you shake hands. Well, as soon as the game ends, about eight guys run at my son. And he thought they were, they were coming to trash him or something, beat him up. Because he had O'Reilly on the back of his jersey. And they go, are you Bill O'Reilly's son? <laughs> and he goes, how do you know my father? YouTube. <laughs> YouTube. It's everywhere. That's the big change. And I don't even know it. I mean, we do very, very well here uh, at BillOReilly.com. And we make a terrific living. And I don't have to answer to anybody. I run the corporations. But that YouTube thing, that's the power of the future. I, I'm curious right now, there's a, there's so much media controversy and stuff going on. And, you know, a lot of people don't know this about you, that you actually have a long background in, in journalism before your sort of on air career. I know you did a lot of local journalism. You've traveled to war zones like El Salvador to cover international conflict. Right now, as we speak, uh, Tucker Carlson is in Russia purportedly interviewing Vladimir Putin. He's catching a lot of flack for that. I'm curious what you think about a decision like that to go sit down with a foreign leader. Personally, I'm, I think it depends wholly on how the interview is done, but I'm interested to hear your view about this controversy and whether you think he should be there or not. Well, it doesn't matter to me how the interview is done. If Carson's uh, savvy enough to get the interview with Putin, more power to Carson, okay? He's the best marketer in the world. He's better than me. Makes me look comatose. Carson is an unbelievable marketer. Why would you criticize Tucker Carlson for sitting down with, with Putin? You already know Tucker Carlson kind of likes Putin, supports Russia in the Ukraine conflict. Everybody knows that. It's not like Carlson's being sneaky about it. For whatever reason, he's thrown in with the Russians. It's his right to do that. So the Russians go, hey, come on over, interview Vlad. Okay. If I got the opportunity, I'd interview Vlad. You'd interview Vlad too, Isaac. Yeah, but they're not going to give me the opportunity. <laughs> it doesn't matter whether they do or not. Vlad's not going to tell you the truth. No matter what you ask him. Hey, did you kill that uh, Wagner guy in the plane? Oh, of course not. Hey, did you kill the 40 journalists that got stabbed with poison? No, oh, no, no, not that me. Hey, oh, no, we had to invade uh, Ukraine because, uh, you know, they threw somebody. You're not going to get anything out of it. Now, you can ask questions in an artful way, but that takes a lot of training to do that. You got to go in prepared to ask the question a little bit differently so you may get something. But anybody inter interviewing Vladimir Putin thinks Vladimir Putin's going to answer any question honestly is insane. It's like Mike Wallace sitting down and interviewing uh, Ayatollah Khomeini. Wallace knew Ayatollah Khomeini was going to answer any questions. All Wallace did, if you watch that interview, was annoy Ayatollah Khomeini by telling him that Sadat and everybody else thought he was a loon. He didn't get anything out of Ayatollah Khomeini other than the evil look. You got to know who you're interviewing. But there's nothing wrong with Carlson going over to Moscow interviewing the guy. I would do it all day long. All right. I know we're, we're coming up on time here. I, I have a couple of quick, quick questions for you before I let you go. First of all, John Stewart coming back to the air on Monday. You and John have a storied relationship, used to go on each other's shows, sort of, uh, you know, a, a counterbalance to each other in the, the nighttime primetime lineup. What do you think about John coming back? Are you guys in touch? Are you talking? I'd love to hear a little bit of your perspective on sure. that because I know you have a deep history. I saw him a few weeks ago. He did a show out in Westbury, uh, Long Island. 
And uh, Stewart is really a talented individual. That's number one. Everybody should know that. Uh, he's moved a little more politically, as many, many uh, people have, to the left because of Trump. Um, Trump is a real, you know, polarizer in the sense that there are Americans, particularly liberals, who hate him so much that they would they think Biden is fine. They'll accept what Biden's throwing out there, which is second worst president ever. And I'll document that in my upcoming book, Confronting the Presidents, which will be out in September. But anyway, Stewart has moved to the left. Um, and again, just like Tucker Carlson, perfect right to move wherever he wants to move. Doesn't offend me. But anyway, when I saw him, and we had the usual back and forth that we always have, you know, he's a lot, he's about, I don't know, 12 years younger than I am. And I look 10 years younger than him. And I said, <laughs> you know, you should do what I do, Stuart. Look at you. You're falling apart. But I'm glad he's coming back. I, I think the guy is very provocative, entertaining. I'll certainly look in. Um, I told him that if he were smart, and that's debatable, he would do another rumble with me on the internet before the election. And then can you imagine what that is? When Carlson interviewed me on X, 30 million people watched that thing. And I think if Stuart and O'Reilly went at it again, you'd get at least 20 million to watch it. But I don't know if he's up for it anymore. I mean, that's a rigorous thing to do. <laughs> uh, I'm curious, you know, you do a good job, I think, on your show of calling out some of the hypocrisy and failures of various politicians from across the political spectrum. Are there any politicians right now you feel really positively about? People in office who you watch what they're doing and you think that they're... Uh, they're they're leading a a worthwhile movement or, or uh, there are the a right lot line? of them, but I don't like to do that because then if I say so and so is brilliant and and really working for you, and then the next day he takes seven hundred thousand dollars from Egypt, you know. So what I do is a case by case, and I think that's the fair way to analyze. And so today on the No Spin News, we said Mitch McConnell's got to go. The turtle's got to go. It's time for the turtle to go out to sea. All right, because this border bill, which is just a catastrophe, it's not going to pass. He got behind that. He didn't even read it. You couldn't have read it and get behind that thing. It doesn't do any good for anybody. So anyway, but there are politicians who I believe want to solve problems. That's my number one limit says, do you have a solution to the problem? Do you want to solve the problem? But it is on a case by case for me. I don't like to throw names out um, unless there, I have verifiable evidence that these people are like going to heaven, that kind of thing. So I don't want <laughs> coming back and hit me in the head. All right, last question, and I'm going to hold you to an answer on, on each of these. I want you, for former President Trump and current President Joe Biden, to give me what you think are each of their biggest strengths and biggest weaknesses headed into 2024. Okay, so you want to start with Trump, the challenger. Um, Trump ran the country well for four years. If your litmus test is helping the folks, real wages up. Inflation down, border controlled, ISIS eliminated, Iran on the defensive, Putin fairly behaving. Okay? So by all of those measures, Trump succeeded. His demeanor wiped it all out. So the election denial from Donald Trump, and he could have done it in a much more methodical way, could have appointed a special prosecutor to look into it, did not. That's Trump's Lewinsky. The fact that he denied the election and that led to January 6th overshadowed everything he did. And that's history. Okay. Um, so his demeanor really hurts him. He should be 20 points ahead, Isaac, today of Joe Biden. 20. Because his administration was so much better than the chaos we have now. Mr. Biden, I believe, is in the early stages of Alzheimer's. 
I say that because I went through it with my mother. I see the same thing that he's doing, and I saw that with my mother. And I'm telling you, I'm 100% on it. The man can't do a pre-interview for the Super Bowl in a friendly CBS audience. You realize there's not one conservative on the air at CBS? Not one in any venue. And Biden can't do an interview with the friendlies? He can't. And his staff and wife knows it. Because he could say anything at any time, blow up. The way he's run the country is the most liberal president ever. He follows the progressive line down to a T, never deviates from it. Americans are paying 17% more today than they did under Trump for the essentials of life. Food, fuel, insurance, all of that. They can say inflation's coming down, you're paying 17% more. More than 10 million foreign nationals are unsupervised in this country, okay, right now, because Biden won't enforce immigration law. Um, Biden is the second worst president in this country's history, only behind James Buchanan, who did the same thing Biden did by failing to hold the rebellious states in the South accountable for four years. So they grew in ferocity. And when Lincoln walked in, the Civil War was a fait accompli. Only Buchanan was worse than Biden. I didn't hear a, a President Biden strength there. Okay, maybe 25 years ago, he had one. Because he got behind, 25 years ago, the very tough bill to punish violent criminals. He was a co-sponsor of that bill. Did you know that? I did. But so, hold on, hold on a second, though. So you don't think there's a single thing that Biden's done that he could run on that is a strength for him heading into this election? The only thing that Biden has done that could be considered a plus is the pressure he has put on the pharmaceutical companies to drop the prices of drugs, especially for senior citizens. And that isn't a law. It's a plan. It's brought drug prices down a bit. That's a positive. But you got to look long and hard find something that this man has done in three years to improve this nation. Overseas, zero. Now, if you are a global warming person, you can point to that, certainly, that he's made it very hard for fossil fuel companies to uh, prosper. But in the meantime, he's just wrecked the marketplace in America for fuel. But if you're a progressive, you like them. I'm not a progressive, but I'm not a conservative. I'm looking for what's best for the folks. I would I would contend. I mean, the war in Ukraine, I think, is both a blemish on his record, but also he did successfully rally NATO allies to their support. I think that was the right decision to push back on Ukraine or push back on Russia. But remember that. Here's where you're making your mistake. And you're a young guy, so you learn from me. (laughs) Ukraine is reactive. He's reacting to a Putin invasion, which is a threat to the world. Putin wins in Ukraine. You kiss Taiwan goodbye. No, no, a lot of people don't care about Taiwan. But you embolden the dictators. You embolden them. They're not going to stop. And history shows us that. So, yes, you're correct. By supporting Ukraine and rallying NATO, Biden did the right thing. But that's not a policy. I mean, that's something that he had to react to. In Israel, he's not doing that. He's trying to walk the tightrope because he knows his party doesn't like Israel, generally speaking. All right. I don't know what more America could do to help Israel at this point. But when President of the United States says he's going to veto a standalone $18 million bill that would help the Israelis. That's pretty frightening to me. Well, let Why me, would you veto that? Let me, let me take you on the economy then. I mean, I think the Biden talking point would be he inherited a, a economy in free fall post-COVID. Like that, that was where the world was. And, you know, he invested industrial policy, manufacturing, unemployment's under 4%. We had inflation, but not as bad as a lot of European counterparts. 
I mean, I think you could make the case that we're watching economic sentiment go up right now. And after three years, some of his policies, at least, have been pretty effective in helping the economy rebound, even on oil. You know, we're, we have more oil production right now than ever before. Prices are not where they were under Trump yet, but they've come down a bit as inflation recedes. I, I, I think there's a case that he's closer to mediocre than second worst president. OK, of all and, time, I, and that's say. fine with me, but I can demolish your arguments and it won't take me a long time because I've got to go. <laughs> All right. Number Bill O'Reilly, I wait, appreciate wait, wait, you wait, wait, Go ahead. Go I want to. I want to demolish you um, for your for your um, listeners. Number one, Trump left office one point four percent inflation. Number two, Trump left office three point five percent unemployment, record employment for African Americans. Number three, Trump left office real wages up seven point two percent. Biden comes in. Immediately tax fossil fuels, which immediately ignites inflation. Wham, like this. Then the whole economy contracts. So when Trump left, and if COVID hadn't hit, Trump would have been easily reelected. When Trump left, the economy was sturdy. It wasn't in decline. It wasn't falling. It wasn't doing any of that. Every All the folks were doing pretty well. All right. Biden comes in. And he knocks out the uh, Remain in Mexico policy, floods the nation with uh, foreign nationals. He puts regulations on uh, and stops drilling for the American um, energy companies. Energy prices go bum. Then he reacts to all of this crazy stuff. And after three years, he's getting some of it under control. But it's all his fault in the beginning. And when you say we have record oil production, that's true. Where's it going? It's going to Europe because they are suffering under um, the Ukraine situation because we're boycotting the Russian oil. That's where most, not most, but much of the U.S. oil production is going. And that's why you haven't seen our oil prices come down. They're a buck more than they were when Trump left. So anyway, there's my demolishment. Good question, though, and good debate. And I hope you guys uh, will get a, good, a lot of good reaction from this uh, back and forth. I appreciate you coming on. I I'm going to score one point before you go, which is I came on your show, Nikki Haley, New Hampshire. We disagreed. I said she was going to stay in the race. You thought she was going to drop out. She's still in the race. We're coming up on South Carolina. So I'll take that point. I'll okay. let my readers and listeners decide on the economy. Bill O'Reilly, I appreciate you coming on. If people want to check out your work, BillOReilly.com. And uh, we'll do it again sometime. Hopefully. Thank you, Isaac, for having me. Thanks, in. Bill. I appreciate it.